our next speaker is Janelle Hamblin from Manitoba Pork. Janelle Hamblin holds a Bachelor's of Sciences in Microbiology and a Master's of Sciences in Animal Sciences, both of them from the University of Manitoba. In her role with Manitoba Pork, she works closely with both industry and government partners to advance swan health provincially, nationally, and internationally. Janelle lives in Winnipeg with her husband and three children, where she enjoys running and curling in her spare time. That's pretty cool. So thank you for coming here uh, to talk to us today about the experiences that you're having in Manitoba. Thank you. Can, can you hear me OK? Yeah, it's coming through. Thank you so much. I'd like to say again thank you so much to the organizing committee for inviting me here to speak today about our experience with PED in Manitoba. Uh, taking in also the information from the experience that you have had in the United States, it's, it really helps to build our knowledge and, uh, as Dr. Yeski said, share that information so that we can all move forward uh, together. So we've had uh, our own experiences with PED in Manitoba, and I'm here to talk to you today about the path that we're taking to work towards elimination of the virus in our province. So PED has been a bit of a roller coaster for us in Manitoba, uh, similar to the, the trends that other presenters have shown. We have seen a, a seasonal pattern, uh, but what I decided to show you here today was really our overall case, cases uh, year over year. So uh, similarly, we saw our first cases of PED in Manitoba in 2014, and we had low levels of cases up until 2017, so four, one, and five in 14, 15, and 16 respectively. And those years, we, we did learn a lot about the virus, but really we, we, we were tested in 2017. Oh, and it yes, a low it's a little low. Okay, I can move this up. Is that better? Is that can better? You do well in the back? Yeah, better. Good, okay. excellent. Thank you for that. Sorry. Yeah, no, no problem at all. In 2017, it was our first large scale outbreak. We had a, a total of 80 cases. And as Dr. Talbot mentioned, uh, we did see that, that trend starting in, in April, May and really ramping up through the summer, which is a really interesting difference between what you're seeing here in the US. So we rode the downward slope of the roller coaster in 2018 with only 17 cases. Uh, following that same time frame, that May to September, October, uh, in 2019, we, we climbed up again to 82, and following a very, very similar outbreak pattern, uh, outbreak curves, as we saw in 2019. In 2020, uh, we were in a really great position. We had three cases of PED confirmed. Now, whether or not there was impacts from our COVID, COVID movement restrictions for people that had played a role in that, we speculate probably so, uh, but three cases was a nice place to be. And we were sitting well until October of 2021 uh, when we did see the start of our largest outbreak to date totaling in 129 cases between the years of 2021 and 2022. Now, I didn't put the downward slope on this graph quite intentionally. I didn't want to jinx it, but we are sitting now in that 2021-2022 outbreak uh, with only three cases remaining in the province. And those three cases are well on their way through their elimination protocol and currently waiting on um, working with our chief veterinary office, our CBO, to achieve their um, elimination status. So I just wanted to touch on 2021, 2022 a little bit in terms of what was different and what we saw. It was our first winter PED outbreak and battling PED in the winter, as Dr. Yeski said, is very different than battling it in the summer. We have very, very cold winters in Manitoba and we had a lot of snowstorms that year, which impacted movements and backed up animals on farm. Uh, which delayed our elimination efforts. We also had a really hard time doing uh, cleaning and disinfection. Disinfectants don't work really well when it's minus 40 Celsius, which is also minus 40 Fahrenheit, and uh, doing proper disinfection was difficult. The impacts of COVID we absolutely saw in this outbreak. We had impacted labor. In the time that you saw that those cases climbing in 2021 is when the Omicron variant hit in December, January of 21, 22. And we saw staff um, impacted and being isolated for their own health, uh, of course. But it is very difficult to practice biosecurity at a high level when you are short-staffed. 
We also saw a change in our geographical distribution of the virus. As Dr. Talbot mentioned, we have an area of our province in southeastern Manitoba, which we call the high-risk area. And I'll refer to it a lot in my presentation as the HRA. And that's where most of our PED cases have been concentrated. However, in 21-22, we did see more cases pop out outside of the, that HRA, that high-risk area. Thankfully, we were able to link those back um, epidemiologically to an infected slaughter facility or a direct animal movement, uh, which did ease some of our concerns that the PED was shifting or ballooning outside of the high-risk area. And in Manitoba, we have an excellent uh, collaboration, working relationship between our sector, our government partners. And what we did see was, and again, uh, one of the earlier presenters mentioned about how we're learning and we're, we're doing better. Uh, and in, the, in this outbreak, we did see that the sector had learned a lot and they were applying their lessons learned and really taking the bull by the horns uh, to do their elimination efforts. And the role that Manitoba Port Council, MPC, and our CBO, our Chief Veterinary Office of Manitoba were playing, were really in filling the gaps of the tracebacks. Not so much involved as heavily in the direct on-farm field work, but more so over analyzing the overall risk and providing guidance as a disease response, uh, as the oversight of the disease response. So in January of 2022, we had a lot of questions come about from our Manitoba, Borg, uh, Manitoba Pork Board of Directors as well as our industry as a whole. How did we get here? What are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? What is the sector going to do to manage PED? This had been our third large scale outbreak in six years. And it was, like I say, riding that roller coaster of up and down. And it was decided that it really wasn't a sustainable uh, path forward. And being that, should we change course? Are there other things that we can be doing to manage PED that will provide us a greater benefit overall to the sector? And what are some of the other strategies that we could employ should we want to change course away from elimination? So this launched the start of the Future of PED Working Group, which was led by Manitoba Port Council. And this was established in February of 2022. And this, this working group had representation across the sector, so producers who had impact, were impacted with PED in that high-risk area, producers in the high-risk area um, that had battled PED a number of times, producers from outside the high-risk area who had never had PED, to give that outlook of um, what the rest of the province, the impacts of the rest of the province um, on what we do in the high-risk area, how it imply or impact others. We had representat representatives from uh, our, our producers, our large integrators, High Life and Maple Leaf, veterinarians uh, representing independent producers and our, our Hutterite colonies, as well as uh, members from our Chief Veterinary Office and us from Manitoba Port Council. And we were working under this mandate of outlining both short and long-term management strategies for PED that would apply to Manitoba look at the tools that we could uh, employ to implement those strategies. So looking at how we could retain immunity, uh, how we could be aggressive in stamping it out, whether or not we continue to move towards eradication. We could determine the impacts of the strategies that we pick in the high risk area where we've had PED, but also in other parts of the province because we are connected and we are integ in, integrated in that pigs move <laughs> throughout the entire province. Uh, as well as providing outreach and messaging to the rest, to the entire sector on how PED management was going to work moving forward. So our first step was to understand what our options were. We had been working towards elimination, but if we were going to do a fulsome review or understand what we could do, all of the options moving forward, we had to understand what those options were. So we commissioned the Western College of Veterinary Medicine to perform, a, to perform this strategy review. And the focus of it was very much on the specific acts, aspects of PDV control and what we could do. So of course, elimination was on the list. We talked about exposing our gilts, running positive flows, going endemic, uh, utilizing vaccinations. So lots of these, or all of these <laughs> different strategies were reviewed and information was provided back to us so that we could come together and make a decision on what we wanted to do moving forward. Now, the, this review had two parts. We had a scientific, scientific literary search, as well as direct interviews with PED experienced veterinarians from hog dense regions of North America. And I'm sure many of you are in the room, the people that we had reached out to 
or the Western College of Veterinary Medicine reached out to and had those direct conversations with direct experience uh, of, again, in those hog dense areas, how PD was managed. And those were Iowa, Minnesota, Kansas, and North Carolina. This is important because the high risk area of Manitoba is very hog dense. We have high density and we felt that in order to best understand which strategy to use, we needed to know how those were being applied in other hog dense areas and what successes and, and weaknesses there were with each strategy. So what we learned uh, from what was presented to us by uh, the Western College of Veterinary Medicine and, and from collective liter literary as well as ad, ad hoc interviews was that all strategies work best no matter which strategy you choose when they're applied collectively. So if I decided I was going to eliminate, but Maria decided that she was going to run positive, we're essentially just fighting each other because there's always going to be a virus around and while well, I'm actively trying to eliminate. So combining those just make it inefficient, especially in a swine dense area. No matter the strategy you choose as well, uh, it requires intensive management and oversight. There was uh, a lot of talk <laughs> going around that oh, if we just let it go endemic, it's, it's going to be fine. It we're, it's going to be easier. It's not going to be as much work. And the, inter the information that we got back was that that's actually not the case. And, and I believe it was Dr. Geske who also brought forward that you're continually to manage uh, outbreaks in your, in your herds. So we, we talked around the table. We had some really great discussion uh, amongst the working group. And I really credit the working group for, for coming to the table and having these difficult conversations. But where we landed was that elimination remained the best option overall for our sector. So from there, we were given the marching orders. Okay, this is what we want to do. How are we going to do it? So this developed uh, into our elimination framework. So we worked in collaboration with our chief veterinary office based on the feedback from the working group. We utilized the pre-seed proceed model. For those of you who are maybe not familiar with it, it is a tool designed specifically for creating and implementing health programming and policy in both in human and veterinary care. And a, a crux of this model is using a goal that is smart. So specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. So working off of those principles, we started the um, developing our framework. So as part of it, once your goal is established, you outline objectives and interventions on how this object or how your goal is going to be achieved. So the interventions are what allow for the change in behavior. And the whole model, the whole framework, allows for evaluation of success over time. So what we've developed for our elimination framework is a five-year model starting in, in 2022. And I say ending, but it will be continuous from 2027 and, and beyond. So what is our goal? Our goal is to eliminate 96% of PED infections from swine premises in our high-risk area of southeastern Manitoba by 2027. This will allow for up to 10 cases of in, 10 infected premises every year while still considering PDV eliminated from the province. These 10 premises will then undergo uh, elimination protocol and not remain positive for more than eight months. Now, a question I often get, so I'm going to <laughs> try to nip it in the bud or uh, pique your curiosity maybe, is why, how we landed on 10. And this is a qualitative and quantitative uh, measure we used or to, to evaluate. So around our working group table, um, which we had great participation and expertise, we asked what would be a tolerable level of PED that we feel comfortable that we could manage, and that number was 10. Okay, so then we went back and we found we, the total number of cases, or sorry, the total number of premises, swine premises, in our high-risk area, and we took 10 less, or 10, took 10 away from there, and that's where we ended up with 96%. Now for this, we want to validate this. We want to know that this is, this is indeed not going to be a, a tipping point where we'll end up with a large-scale outbreak if 10 is the right number. So we are currently exploring some disease modeling to validate if this number is correct, and I'll get to that a little sooner. So this, uh, this is very small, and I promise I will get into each of these in more detail, but just to give you a visual of what our um, framework looks like for PED elimination in Manitoba. So we have our overarching goal, we have the objectives that we have outlined into how we're gonna achieve that goal, and then the actions or interventions that we're gonna take to achieve the objectives. So as I mentioned, you don't have to strain your eyes, I'm gonna go into these in more detail. 
So these objectives and interventions, uh, they outline prevention and intervention activities that have been designed to achieve our objectives. The working group requested a change to the response that we have been doing in order to prevent these large scale outbreaks from occurring. So our plan outlines the how, how we're gonna do it. And I, I have to stress this is an outcome based plan. We recognize and the herd veterinarians were very clear with us that each farm is different in how it's managed, uh, the, the infrastructure, the design, the flow, the staffing, there are so many intricacies on a swine farm that applying a one-size-fits-all one approach wasn't gonna work. So we needed to develop outcomes or overall objectives that um, we can achieve, but it might look a little bit different based on how that farm is running. So our first objective, and again, keeping that SMART goal in mind, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound, was to reduce the number of infected premises by at least 50% during our next scale, large scale outbreak, and then year after year over that. So we address these in our prevention, uh, both of our prevention activities as well as our intervention activity, which I will get to in more detail. Our second objective is to shorten the time to transitional status during the next large scale outbreak. Now I realize that <laughs> the group here may not understand what transitional status means, and I, was re I recognized that as I was practicing this presentation yesterday. So uh, in Manitoba, we have an elimination, uh, different statuses that we work through as we eliminate PD from the farm. So when you're positive, you have positive pigs on your site. When you're transitional, for a sow farm, you're weaning negative pigs and you're going through your cleaning and disinfection. For a nursery or finisher, you no longer have positive pigs or recovered pigs on your site to achieve transitional status. Now this one is important because in our last outbreak, we saw our elimin elimination efforts were struggling and, and I referred to that earlier in, in impacts of COVID, impacts of weather, uh, and we saw farms that traditionally were able to eliminate the disease very efficiently, were having a difficult time. So we wanted to address that in, in this plan to say we want to eliminate as quickly as we can uh, or that's possible to really shorten that, that risk period or that time that a farm is positive for PED. So again, this is addressed in our intervention one, rapid and aggressive response. Our third objective, and Dr. Talbot did a fantastic job of talking about our biosecurity and, and the, the tools that we use and the practices that we employ in Manitoba, and we've come a long way since 2017. But we wanna continuously improve and review so working to continuously improving our biosecurity for all stakeholders within the HRA and really all stakeholders in the province by 2027. We talk about this in our prevention, um, enhancing our biosecurity, as well as in, in our interventions of strict, and strict biosecurity biocontainment, as well as ongoing uh, management of high traffic, high risk facilities. Coupled with that, our national organization, the Canadian Port Council has been working on developing a new national biosecurity standard for swine in Canada. And we were very fortunate uh, between 2022 and now to pilot the national biosecurity benchmark on 244 of our farms. And that's actually probably higher um, than when I put this presentation together. Uh, the pilot did cover external measures only, so by exclusion, but the, the new national standard is addressing bio, bio exclusion, biomanagement and biocontainment. So all components but that is continuing, uh, the development is continuing. Uh, and uh, as well, Manitoba Pork is offering to continue to any farm, to offer this service to any farm that is interested. And we are currently doing a, a more in-depth data analysis to identify areas of improvement and outline best practices for our farms moving forward. So looking at PED specifically and what, what practices we can be improving on, but also as a whole for our sector. Our fourth objective was to develop farm level procedures addressing infection control. So these were targeted towards producers and veterinarians. We felt that it was important to have components of our plan that outline how elimination was gonna work. Again, outcome based because each farm is different and but um, establishing or identifying what those outcomes are for each part of a PED elimination on farm. 
so we put together, I think there's 10 of them here, uh, 10 different procedures that were reviewed by our veterinarians in Manitoba across the whole province. And we are, we've put them into our plan so that somebody who is, who has never had PED before could pick it up and understand the principles of what we're talking about. Again, it is very outcome based and it is more at a high level and targets uh, working with your veterinarian, um, the emphasis on veterinary oversight when applying these protocols. By no means do we expect somebody who's never had PED before to be able to pick this up and just run with it. Uh, this is very much intended on having full veterinary oversight throughout the entire application. As I mentioned, we are working to complete some disease modeling to support the goal that we have created as well as the interventions that we have established. So we're working very closely with our provincial chief veterinary office uh, to develop a model to test again the feasibility of our plan. The goal of that is to determine if those 10 IPs that we have allowed at the end of our time frame is sustainable and won't lead to a new outbreak. Is that cut point true? Or, or is it seven? Or is it 15? What's that tolerable level of PD that we can manage? And uh, we've actually just put or finished our request for proposals and we'll be working with the disease modeling consultants with hopefully having, having results by spring, summer 2024 uh, to help inform further our plan. And lastly, our final objective was to continue to enhance the education awareness around PED spread and elimination. Uh, we have been doing this ongoing. This, hasn't, this isn't new, but we felt that it was important to, to say and to bring forward that we're not just going to finish this plan, put it on the shelf and be done. We, wanted, we want producers, we want sector stakeholders to understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and that this is a continuous process. And as we get new information, we'll have those targeted updates to, to share and extend. So now getting more into the how, we talked about our objectives or the what, what we want to do. So we've established, as I mentioned, those, those activities, whether it be prevention or intervention, to apply to our objectives. So our prevention activities, we have two of them, uh, and Dr. Talbot really hit the nail on the head here, is continuously working to improve our biosecurity specifically in the high risk area. So can we apply, and what our recommendation is, is having that higher enhanced level of biosecurity as our new standard for farms in the high risk area. Questions that we've come back is, is can this be maintained? Uh, practicing biosecurity at a high level is, is not easy, uh, but I think the, the payoff will be worth it. Uh, or can we look at different high risk periods, understanding, looking at the, the the patterns that we've seen in the past, uh, can we enhance even further during high risk periods and what would that look like? Secondly, we are working currently on developing an on-farm surveillance program. There are farms that, and Corinne has mentioned, that are currently doing on-farm surveillance in the high risk area now. Can we expand that? Can we expand that to all farms in the high risk area and what would that look like? So again, working with our chief veterinary office we have put together a preliminary proposal on what on-farm surveillance, weekly on-farm surveillance for PED would look like. So taking those samples, using that, the booty method, uh, figuring out logistics around sample drop-off, diagnostic capacity, uh, and reporting, and utilizing that information to help uh, better the sector and the sector knowledge. And our rationale for this is, again, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. The stronger biosecurity in the HRA will just help to improve or prevent infections. And if we can catch PED early using our, our programs on farm, it really will help to improve or limit the downstream infection in the sector. So moving on to interventions. So prevention is when we don't have PED. So interventions are if we get cases of PED. This is what we would do. First one is a rapid and aggressive response. And these, what you see here applies to our sow farms, and I'll get into nursery and finisher on the next slide. But what we're looking at doing, and it's, it's not very different from what Dr. Yeski just described, it's creating that gap in production in the sow farm with the outcome of weaning negative pigs. And, our, and again, the, the outcome is weaning negative pigs. If you can do that in 21 days, great. If you can do it in 35 days, okay. But the rationale here is really to provide that greatest risk mitigation possible. 
So our recommendation is to make sure that you have that and we, we lean more towards the 30 to the 35 uh, day end of the spectrum. But we have had success in weaning negative pigs in 21 days. So far be it for me to say, well, no, you've got to kill more pigs even though they're all negative. So if you're able to achieve that outcome, that's where the disease response overall is happy. As well, we want to limit downstream infection from the sow farm. So as Corinne mentioned, full stop movement. Full stop movement for four weeks to prevent that, the virus from leaving the farm and obviously strong biocontainment. And again, our overall goal is to reduce the number of infected premises and shorten that time to transitional status. If we can, if we can rapidly and aggressively respond and have success, then we will, again, shorten that risk period, the amount of time that that farm is positive. So applying to nursery finisher and fair to finish, uh, a nursery or finisher uh, operation, you would be implementing a strong biocontainment. So locking down that site, no movements for four weeks, and um, again, practicing strong levels of, of biocontainment. Fair to finish would apply what I just discussed with the sow farm and then the biocontainment all the way through production. A key part of our plan really is the no movements for four weeks. Now I recognize that there may be scenarios where animals need to move. And we talked about that around our board table. So are there exemptions to the rule? And where we landed with that is because we work so closely and so well with our, within our sector, uh, having those conversations with the overarching disease response led by Manitoba Pork and the Chief Veterinary Office, if there's a situation that warrants pigs to move, whereas moving them is actually less risk than keeping them on site and creating a large viral plume, then we would look at that. We would address that and always pick the lower risk um, option for the sector moving forward. And I say this here and I'll reiterate it again, producers are required to work with their herd veterinarian on, on all PED elimination activities. It is a provincially reportable disease and in consultation with the disease response, as I mentioned, co-led by the CBO, the Chief Veterinary Office, and us at Manitoba Pork. So our second intervention um, is around biosecurity and biocontainment. Again, intervention, we have PED. So focusing on those infected farms, practicing that high level of biosecurity. And we have protocols that offer guidance to those practices as part of the plan. As well, those farms that are in a buffer area, so you have an infected farm within five kilometers of you, your biosecurity needs to step up as well. We have had enough evidence of area spread in Manitoba to know that the virus will move. And so with, if you're in within five kilometers of an infected site, your biosecurity needs to go up as well. And again, our overall goal here is to limit the spread of infection. Our third intervention is the management of high traffic, high risk premises. So assembly yards, slaughter plants, and wash bays. Again, part of that 10 uh, PEDV cases per year, we know that we still have risk of PED to Manitoba. We have contact with premises that we know have PED. We have a surveillance program in place at our high traffic facilities, including our assembly yards and, and slaughter facilities. Uh, and we see regular positives from our assembly yards for PED. So PED is there and we need to understand that the risk remains and until we can clean it up across the sector and with contacts that we have, we have regular contact with the United States, there will still be continued risk. So we need to uh, continue to address it. And some of the activities that we're doing and, and Corinne mentioned, Manitoba Pork offers PDV surveillance at high traffic facilities. So we do weekly sampling and it really is um, an effective warning sign to know if and when PED is, is showing its ugly head again. We perform transporter biosecurity assessments at our high traffic facilities, knowing that they are a high risk facility. We regularly go out and talk with our, our transporters, our truck drivers, for them to understand and continuously uh, improve the level of biosecurity they're practicing with these facilities. It's very much an educational um, program and uh, we offer it with through Manitoba Pork. Along with that, our biosecurity programming uh, we do annual wash station assessments. So the protocols have been developed with veterinarians in Manitoba to understand a high level, high quality wash. And every year we go out again, a staff with Manitoba Pork to evaluate how those uh, facilities are operating and where they can improve. 
uh, as well, we continue with ongoing outreach to biosecurity on biosecurity to all facilities with the overall goal of reducing that ongoing risk. So as I mentioned, our work is not done. We are, we haven't, you know, wiped our hands and said, okay, we've got our plan, we're good. We have a lot more work to do. Uh, things that we wanna continue to explore um, revolve around vaccines, vaccination options. What could we do? How could we help to um, protect ourselves? Use all those tools in the toolbox. We are currently working on a project with the Canada West Swine Health Intelligence Network to look at loadout design and site modification. And, and Dr. Geske, your, your slides were perfect for this in terms of how the risk that loadouts present to move PED, it, animals move, it is a big risk factor transport. And we have found that different loadouts are better suited to minimize that risk. So actually that work is just completing and we're hoping to have some information to share with that soon. Manure management is an ongoing consideration. Uh, manure management, manure, manure spreading season is in full bore in Manitoba right now. And I, uh, I thank my lucky stars every day when I don't get a message that we have had a case of PED. Uh, the other one, and, and Corinne talked about this too, is, is exploring the, sh the shared flow of recovered pigs. So in order to uh, accomplish that reduced number of infected premises, can we look at farms breaking fewer premises by moving positive pigs from two separate entities into one site? So if Maria's nursery is positive, I have a sow barn that just broke, you have a sow barn that broke, could we figure out how to work together so that, and it would look different depending on the situation, but moving positive animals or keeping them all in one spot. So our working group was really keen on this idea uh, because as Corinne mentioned, we, we are very hog dense and if we can limit the number of premises that are positive, it really just helps the sector overall, no matter who owns the site. So in terms of our next steps, uh, we have had endorsement from our, uh, our sector, our working group, and our, the Manitoba Port Council Board of Directors endorsing the plan with the full initiation beginning in fall 2023. So as I mentioned, we have three cases left uh, from the 21-22 outbreak, and those are very close to the end of their elimination protocol. So anything new that came, that could come uh, but from now, we would be applying the elements of this plan. Written into this plan is, is continuous review and, and updates as more work is completed and as we learn more year over year. So as again, this, the working group is not done. And I, I think I have this line on three slides. <laughs> Producers must work with their herd veterinarian through a PD elimination and in, in uh, consultation with the disease response. So this is, it really just hits home the level of collaboration and the information sharing that we need to have in order to have success for this plan. I'm getting to the end, I promise. Uh, our PED elimination timeline, so again, just a visual of, of what the five-year plan is gonna look like. And I debated on whether or not to start with this slide or end with this slide, but I think it summarizes things uh, really nicely. So in 2022, we created the working group, we put together that, the PED review, we did our on-farm biosecurity assessments, and we started the development of our elimination framework. In 2023, we took that framework, the elements, the goal, the objectives, and we started writing the, the interventions and the prevention activities. So the plan started to form. We also did some communication and outreach. And actually the plan is currently being revised uh, because we've got some really great feedback. And so there's the, the version of the, of the plan is always gonna be changing based on, on what we learn. And again, we started our disease modeling in 2023. In 2024, Based on our seasonal pattern, we are, this is when we're anticipating our next large-scale outbreak. Do we want that to happen? No, but we can't keep our heads in the sand. So under the, under the plan, under how it's written, this would allow for up to 65 cases of uh, PED and then shortening the overall outbreak down. And again, of course, working towards uh, assessing the data that we have, that we've learned from our assessments, our Cushion Canada West Swine Health Intelligence Network, our loadout project, and then applying those findings back to the plan. And then that theme kind of runs through 25, 26, 27. So continuously applying those lessons learned with that 50% reduction of cases over time, if all goes well. <laughs> and then by 2027, having no more than that 10 case uh, annually, continuing to apply those rapid and aggressive responses 
uh, to minimize the impact. The document, uh, it is a summary of all of our planning to date. It does outline the recommendations and procedures that we have created. And as I mentioned, it is evergreen. Um, it is posted on our website. The version that's there today will not be the same version that's there next week when I get home and apply <laughs> the lessons that we've learned. Uh, so as we learn more, it will be updated. A disclaimer, just so that everybody knows what we've done and how we're gonna do it. This plan was put into place and is a compilation of our best practices and recommendations for the swine sector to manage PED. It was developed in collaboration with representatives of the entire Manitoba swine sector, producers, veterinarians, industry experts, and our chief veterinary office. All components of the plan are intended to be applied in accordance with their herd veterinarian and in consultation with the disease response. Our board of directors at Manitoba Pork endorsed the recommendations of the plan, but the adoption of the plan is strongly recommended and is not regulated. Lastly, and probably very importantly, is around communication and advocacy. We want people to know what we're doing. We want, to know, we want them to know why, how we got here. And I am free to answer as many questions as I can. If I have the answer to them, if I don't, I will tell you that I don't have the answer to it. Um, but all producers and sector stakeholders do have a role to play, whether or not you're in that high risk area or not. We have, um, our, our sector is, is, there's lots of contacts. We have, as I mentioned, um, communal areas, assembly yards, slaughter facilities. The sector is, is connected and we need to address it. We at MPC, Manitoba Pork, will continue to promote the elimination plan and provide updates as they become available. And I think the biggest thing here is that recognizing that we are all working towards the same goal, the same outcome, but the way we do it might look a little bit different farm to farm. And that's okay as long as we are focusing on those outcomes and that goal. Questions? Yeah. Jason. Nice presentation. I, I like the plan. I'll be interested to see it when it's uh, updated. Absolutely. <clears throat> uh, one question I had on the assembly yards, it's a little different than our industry. Uh, not totally, but uh, as I understand it, all the cull sows end up in the, in the U.S. Yes. Uh, so they're assembled into yards and uh, it sounds like you're doing routine testing there. Are you doing the booty testing or if you could elaborate a little bit on sure. what you're doing there? Yep. Uh, I think it differs a little bit yard by yard. Um, some are using the Swiffer method. I don't know if any of them have adopted the booty method fully, um, but we're looking at, there's actually, there's two ways the sampling is being done. Um, staff from Manitoba Port go out and we do every quarter, we'll go and do a, a whole yard survey uh, for PED. So we go in and we take samples of the intakes, intake docks, the, the, the uh, shipping docks, the feeders, the pens, so we do the whole thing. And then the, the other weeks that the, that's not happening, the yard staff are testing the intake, the intake docks, because the shipping docks, we, I mean, we know. So <laughs> the intake docks are sampled weekly, and then, like I say, we do a full assessment quarterly, with mostly with this, I think it's mostly with the Swiffer. No, no. This is, this is um, actually part of our future considerations as well. There's a lot of future considerations. Um, but continuing to manage those, those yards and how we can improve, that's something that's not, ev that's not only related to PED. Uh, there's multitude of disease risk and, and we need to address them. Anything that we can apply for PED would have impact on any and all disease. You mentioned biosecurity standards, and it, and it sounded like maybe that's a, little, a work in progress yet. Uh, but uh, can you expand a little bit more on what you think those might look like? And then depending on your answer, I may have a follow-up. So. so at the sow farm or premises overall, or what, sorry, I'm... Uh, well, that's what I'm what trying to understand. What, what do you have in mind for biosecurity standards? What would that look like? Well, uh, Corinne did a great job of, of discussing uh, describing what our biosecurity standards really have become um, after 2017 and they've continued to grow. So exact um, examples, so yeah, 
shower in, shower out across facility, is that is that commonplace outside of high life? Probably not quite yet. Um, but working towards constant and improved Danish entry, parking away from the CAS, we've had discussions about um, uh, overall risk from manure and doing whether or not air filtration is, is possible, uh, looking at what Corinne has done with, with more um, rudimentary air filtration maybe as opposed to filters on your intakes. Uh, we've talked about reducing contacts, reducing the number of times that you have or maximizing or optimizing how many contacts you have on your farm. So feed efficiency or feed uh, delivery. Can you improve your storage or maximize your support storage so that you don't have as many contacts on your farm? Uh, reducing visitors, any, any visitors, service providers. Can we supply them with, uh, their, with the equipment that they need? Obviously there are specialized equipment that a farm isn't gonna have, but what can we do to make as few contacts on that farm day in, day out? and making it, I'll say normal, like this is just what we do now. And it kind of becomes second nature as opposed to having to critically think, and okay, did I, did I do that properly? Yeah. I don't know if that helps to answer your question. It, it does, and I missed Corinne's presentation. Oh, okay. Part of that, <laughs> uh, so my follow-up then is, is that the biosecurity practice, or standards sort of assume kind of a one-size-fits-all, that, that, the, that the hazards, the biosecurity hazards are kind of the, the same everywhere, and we can address them with the same control measures, is that true? And the way a standard is written, it's difficult to not look at it that way. But I think the way that we've applied it to a farm has made it more individual. So when we're creating our, the national standard, it, it is difficult. It's difficult to, to think of. And I was part of that, I am part of that working group, that committee that's developing the national standard. And let me tell you, it's been three years and it's been a labor of love. We've worked through as many situations as we could to apply to every single individual circumstance. Um, but we, I mean, we'd have a thousand page document <laughs> if that's what it was. So um, is the standard overarching and best practices? Yes, but the application of those practices are intended to be applied to that specific farm, if that makes sense. Thank you very much once again.